gotta ask you today's question i gotta ask you about pinkerton everybody always wants to know about pinkerton it's the legendary weezer album and I don't know if you know my history with Weezer. You know that I got a demo tape. I'll, I'll give you the long story because you probably don't know it. I don't. And it'll be fun. Somewhere 92, 93, I was working on a project over at Master Control. You remember Master oh, yeah, Control yeah. in Burbank? Yeah. Aceley. I, you remember the Recycler, the, oh, yeah. the, which was a free ad newspaper? It was Craigslist on I paper. I was selling some anvil cases through the Recycler, and this guy calls me and says, I want to buy some of these cases. Comes down to the studio and says, I'll buy these two from you. And he said, oh, you're a producer. I have a cassette here of my band's demos. W would you listen to them? And I was like, sure, of course. So take the cassette from him. It's Matt Sharp, okay, oh, shit, that's the funny. bass player. Yeah. So I take the cassette, and for some reason, I don't listen to it right away. I put it in my car in the side compartment, and about two or three weeks later, I'm going Saturday morning, going to the car wash, and cleaning out stuff to go to the car wash, and I find the cassette, and I'm like, oh, I should listen to this. He was a nice guy, right. you know? I put the cassette in. First song is Jonas. Oh, shit. Then Say It Ain't So, Sweater Song. And I instantly get the phone, and because it was the days of car phones, and I call Matt, and I'm like, hey, your band is great. I, I love these songs. You know, what are you guys all about? What are you doing? And he said, well, we have a rehearsal house that we're, we all live at in West L.A. You know, why don't you come over to the house? So I go to their place. They're all living in this house together in West L.A. Anyways, long story short, they were playing around town. I helped them get to record companies. I got them to Electra, to Interscope, to Capital, to a bunch of labels. Everybody passed on them. Everybody said, I don't know about the songs. I don't know. You know, those, oh the vocals God. aren't that great. You know, the harmonies are really out of tune. So for about six months or so, I tried to shop the band. Maybe it was longer than that couldn't restless actually uh restless records which was enigma records was bill hine was one of the first people that was into the band but they were a small label. right it's always the indie that has the taste and the foresight to go this is great exactly and then all of a sudden the major label snips yeah. it and says uh -oh. and the minute todd sullivan was the first uh, real record label that came and saw him and got it and then as you know eventually they signed uh, to Todd at Geffen but the guys were great in, in that they took care of me they gave me a finder's fee and everything that's and, awesome you know and you know they Todd got involved and then he got Rick Ocasek involved and and the rest is is yeah. history you know but segue to second album Pinkerton which is one of the ones that really stands the test of time. And you were a major part of that. And I mean, I still hear El Scorcho all the time on the radio. Oh, yeah. And and from that opening guitar tone, whatever that is, like clean guitars, double tracked or what, whatever, it just like you instantly are like, I'll listen to this. This has got a character. This has That's got a it. sound. This has got a personality. Like, what did you do? How did you get that guitar sound? How, what What is that album all about? Tell us about it. All right, well, Todd, Todd Sullivan actually called me and said, um, we're going to make another record. And this is after the, the Blue Album, which is monumental. And uh, you know, he said, we want you to remix Say It Ain't So, because they had taken all the feedback out of it. It muted all the feedback, so if the, you'll hear it on the radio sometimes. There's no feedback in the down down in the chorus part. So I was going to Electric Lady to remix that, and the whole time thinking, why don't they just get Chris Shaw to do it? Because he makes the album and it sounds incredible. So they did get Chris Shaw to do it, and so I started Pinkerton next door while Chris was mixing, remixing, wow. saying it. So, so that the one thing they said was. Um, 
the band hated to use headphones. So we're at Electric Lady and I set it up so that they played live. Was there a great band they could totally play live? Yep. And we used wedges and they had the self cues, but the self cues powered wedges. So the whole room was basically on, you know, blowing up at the time. It was, it was four guys and, and Matt Sharp, as you know, has an insane bass sound. He's using orange heads and, and cabinets that were so loud. And, and uh, Brian was playing a um, uh, Travis Bean. <laughs> and Rivers, I don't, I don't remember honestly what guitar Rivers had at the Probably time. It was some Fender sort of Stratty yeah. like with a humbucker. Right. But we had a 30th anniversary Marshall in there and a, a Plexi 50 watt. And it was basically live. Everything about it was live. And the thing that I couldn't get past was trying to tie it all together in the room because it was so blown out. And the blue record was not really blown out. And so I... Uh, knowing Jason Cassaro and him being a mentor and him working with Eddie Martinez, a great guitar player, I always loved Eddie's sounds and, and Robert Palmer and the stuff he yeah. did there. So I, we went to visit Eddie one day and I, I asked Eddie about his guitar sound and he said, I used to use these electroharmonics linear power boosters. Oh yeah, the those little, little ones you LPB plug into your plug LPB in ones. You plug them into your guitar and yeah. he, he rack mounted them because they were so bad you know, running around on stage that he puts them in the rack and he goes, I got a bunch of them here. Do you want to take a few and, and try them out? So he gave me a shoe box full of old LPB ones that were half broken and I cobbled a couple together. And when I got there, I actually ended up, I had a pair of M49s on the room of the band live and I put the LPB ones on the room sound. What? I blew up the $20,000 tube mics with a $20 LPB one and that was the room sound that created the bombasticness of that band playing live. Because it does have such a dark, dirty tone compared to the first record. And I remember talking to Rivers about it after, and Chris Shaw as well, and they told me that Rick's whole thing was, I, I want to say it was a Mesa Boogie amp, but I might be wrong about that, mm -hmm. but basically small amps turned down really low, really very little SPL, crank the preamp, get the distortion there, and very little SPL so the speaker isn't really pushing a lot of uh, air, which means you turn the mic preamp up, and of course everything comes up forward. to your face and feels like a really huge guitar sound. So they really went from I that... I went the other way. A whole Our, other way. Yeah, I was like, how do you, how do you make this... There were other things happening at the time within the band, and, and uh, Matt had the rentals as well, and he right. was just got a deal on Maverick, so yep. he, is, he was in that area, and Brian had just come into the band. And um, so together as a, as a team, to make it cohesive and, and Electric Lady, which kind of the way people tell me that the sound of the room changed every day, because there was water the, the going humidity. underneath there. Yeah, yes, the so. river. There's a river that runs underneath back in the bass amp closet there where you used to always put the B15 or whatever you put the bass, whatever kind of bass amp it was, you put it in this closet in the back of the room. And the New York City River ran yeah, under that and it. would flood sometimes. And I remember working in there where you would come in in the morning and the bass amp would be soaking uh, wet. That's I, I just put them all in the same room. They just wanted to hear each other and, and to get that cohesiveness to gel. The only way I could do it was to blow up the room a little bit and it came down to Eddie Martinez's LPB ones. And that's, there's so much live on that record, you know, and I, at, at some point, I mean, he's going past the guitar sound at this point, but it was a Marsh, it was two Marshalls, a 30th anniversary for Rivers and a, a 50 watt Plexi reissue JMP for Brian. And Matt's Orange, which I still try to buy to this day because it sounded so good. Really? And they were just on just power, power amp distortions blowing up oh. in that room with the M49s on stun and cut live to tape and then on some tape editing going on between takes. And, and there, there was actually so many songs. It was insane. And um, Rivers is a, is a great soloist and yes. Brian's a great guitar player. Has some very unique styles together so that worked and Matt just hunkering it all down and Pat obviously Pat's it. Do you remember anything specifically about El Scorcho or Tired of Sex or any of the, the specific songs? I, I remember just asking like a lot of times your your engineer mind goes that drum kit is not tuned as well as it can be you know like you're hitting that floor tom and it's howling and I'm like it's just obvious when you're tight mic'd 
so you push the mics away and that's where you go that's where the mentality for me came about just trying to capture the big picture room because when you hit that floor tom now it doesn't quite howl as much and sound like it's pitching down yes yes but when you do hit that first drum fill you go this is a unique drum sound which you know I, I, if you can't beat them you join them and and they loved at the time they were bringing up uh some references like um, this is where end up dave friedman end up coming back into the picture they love flaming lips and they loved uh the band hum um oh, yeah. keith cleversley i think is the yep. guy and they they would bring me stuff like that which was uh vaseline from stp a little bit later on you're just like okay this is not your normal blue record right. hi-fi right rock sound the drums are all taped up and dead and yeah, point just, sources the snare really it sounds pretty natural to me but it's definitely brighter and ringier crisper overall than than the previous record and and actually from what they would do after that i mean that yeah. record really it stood stands out. alone in the catalog it kind of went back to rick on the green album and i think tom Algae mixed it and we added some keyboard stuff i mean the tapes came in but we ended up doing keyboard overdubs after he mixed it i think it was crazy but i think no one knew at the time that it might be the predecessor to what would be called emo you know which people tell me that that's their reference i mean i listen to the blue record and go this sounds awesome yeah i like pinkerton as well because of the involvement but there was it was really like a very unorthodox method of everything everything to the you probably haven't done a record like that since then have you? no not like that and, and there was points when you do bad religion do you do th that stuff in, live some in of it? it was cut live yeah. i mean I tr you know the one thing about working today is everything's kind of pieced together and yes. you never really know what things are going to sound like until you get to the mix stage you know but back then not me <laughs> oh yeah you knew the you knew the well the, i'll tell you one interesting story about that record was at one point we were working at fort apache and um, because it was live, you know, the, they wanted to change a note on the guitar, but the bass was already done and Matt wasn't around. So the, we could easily change the note on the bass, but the note on the bass is in the room. So I literally was using an H3000. I was calling it Joe Tools, and I was sampling the room and pitching it to the correct note and flying it in punching it in like two-handed and, and this is analog tape, analog tape so yeah. as the tape went by i could pitch matt's bass to like what an a to an a sharp or whatever but right. i'd also have to pitch the room because it would still sound out of tune until i pitched anything that the bass was bleeding through which is pretty much everything at that point it's, so, it is pretty amazing when you think of, you know, sort of how crude the, our tools were then. And, you know, it was the it, harmonizer that yeah. you tuned, tuned a voice. Yeah. You know, I mean, somebody it, it, went a little bit sharp. You patched it in the harmonizer. And when the note came along, you just went. You yeah. Know. And then, and no one really cared, you know. I mean, a little bit out of tune here and there was actually good. Yeah. It was exciting. It was real. Yeah. You know, I, I love 70s records that are. To me, they're maybe a little bit sharp because they speed them up to get through the radios and get that commercial in there yep. and that excitement of being slightly sharp. Why not? As long as everybody tunes at the same note, who cares? Oh, you're right. It gives things a, a, an edge. Yeah. 